Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 311 featuring Robert Dernan, who's someone who I worked with at Digital Domain for a while. And he's also done, but he was a TD at, at, at uh, Digital Domain, but he's done a bunch of other development, done a bunch of XR stuff and a bunch of interesting things. He worked at Magnopus for a while. He's been kind of a little bit everywhere, right, Kristen? Yeah, it's like... <laughs> I said he's like very adventurous, like cause he's been all over the place, um, mm -hmm. kind of like a perpetual learner. He kind of talks about that at the end too. Like he really learns each thing he goes to. He doesn't do anything halfway. So no, no, no. Yeah, he takes yeah. it fully. Like I'm going to learn all about that one thing, mm -hmm. and then he'll learn. Yep, yeah, absolutely. You, you nailed it. And what's you know, he said he's very adventurous. Like he's not. He's willing to move and go all over the place. And after we finished recording, he goes, "Oh, I forgot to tell you this story." But basically, he went on vacation somewhere in South America. Uh, or it may have been Central America. I don't remember exactly, but right before the pandemic, and he got stuck there for like a couple of months <laughs> because he couldn't fly back right as the pandemic hit, which is really kind of amazing. Like in trying to work out of a resort, I don't, I, I don't know all the details, but it was quite amazing. So, uh, yeah, he's a pretty cool guy. I really like Robert. He does a lot of really cool stuff. We talk about. Uh, the, obviously, a lot of the stuff that he got into being a TD and what that means about developing tools, which I think is something very interesting to learn about what it means to develop tools and to work with companies to develop tools. He's done a bunch of stuff at the XR and AR world. He sort of started a company as well, and then he worked at Magnopus as well. Mm -hmm. So all of those really, really cool things that are going on. So I like this podcast. I thought it was great. Robert was very, very interesting. I think there's a lot to be to be learned about what it takes to be a developer in, in, mm -hmm. in today, you know, like it, what it, what that, what that can be. So really cool stuff. Uh, great. We have just a few announcements this week. Yep. Not as much because a lot of things have sort of ended, but going on, what's, what's happening? So you can find these out at chaosgroup.com. As yep. we have talked about, Vantage is out. And yep. so is V-Ray 5 for Cinema 4D. And mm -hmm. also we have V-Ray 5 uh, for Revit Beta available. Right. Right, V-Ray 5, as you guys know, is rolling out all over the place. We're going to have some uh, some big stuff going on in, in you know, a few weeks uh, for V-Ray 5 uh, across the board, so we're excited about that. But for V-Ray 5 for Revit, obviously people have been wanting to know about V-Ray 5 for, for, for Revit, and it's in beta now, so please go check it out. Uh, we'd love to get your feedback. Obviously, V-Ray 5 for C4D has been mo much anticipated as well, so if you guys are interested in that, uh, it's available also on our website. Vantage, uh, by the time this podcast comes out, I believe that the uh, the Building Utopia competition will be over. Uh, but I really look forward to finding out what people are able to do with Vantage. Vantage is our real-time ray tracer standalone package that's fully ray traced, fully real-time. Uh, and really curious to see what cool stuff people do with Vantage uh, uh, and if they use it to their advantage. I love that joke. Ooh, I don't know why. So good. <laughs> it's a stupid joke. No, it's stupid. <laughs> don't, don't laugh at that. Kristen, don't laugh oh. at that. Don't encourage that behavior. Okay, um, uh, great. So uh, if people, obviously, as, as Kristen said, all of this information is available at chaosgroup.com and, uh, you know, go ahead and check it out. If people want to know more about the podcast, where can they go? You can go to facebook.com slash cggaragepodcast or chaosgroup.com slash cggarage. Perfect. And if you guys have ideas for podcasts, guests, or any feedback whatsoever, let us know. Labs at chaosgroup.com. We'd love to let you know. Uh, uh, you know, love to, to hear from you and know what you what you guys uh, want to hear. Uh, also, as you guys know, we are doing videos of all of these podcasts. So those are also available on our Facebook page. And you can see us in video form. Uh, I'm experimenting with some new higher end video cameras for our <laughs> podcast. I was like, well, we've been doing this for almost a year now, Kristen, almost a mm -hmm. year. <laughs> All the so, videos too. I went yeah, back I and looked the other day. I was like, oh, whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had even let more hair back then, but uh, not that I have much left. Uh, but anyway, so uh, that's also available. And of course, on our YouTube channel, it is Chaos Group TV. And we put all of our podcasts up on Chaos Group TV, uh, which is available on YouTube. All right. That being said, please enjoy this amazing podcast with Robert Dernan. Welcome to another CG Garage, where the Chaos Group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion 
is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. How are you? Um, I'm all right, man. I'm a bit tired. I've been um, doing a lot of interviewing early in the morning with people overseas. And it's meant to. Uh, a lot of sitting up, getting ready for things, and then being up at six and seven in the morning to talk to them. It's kind of burning the candle at both ends. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Why are you? In, what, what are you interviewing? What's going on? Um, well, I mean, I got the early start of my career in the EU, and um, I have an Irish passport, which is kind of um, something I've been meaning to resurrect and go back. To, to go and look for work. Now, I left LA at the end of August. Okay. And, um, and I've been kind of planning to go back to either Berlin or to Barcelona for work, depending on a couple of things, you know? Right. Um, but you, where did you, you went back to Vancouver or something, right? Yeah. Okay. Definitely. And that's where you're yeah. from, right? I'm originally from Vancouver. You're originally from yeah. Vancouver. All right. Well, let's let's give people a little bit of history because we, you and I have actually worked together, uh, and you, yeah. you and I worked together on on Tron, uh, yeah. which is where I think we first met, uh, mm -hmm. and we did a lot of uh, some interesting work back then. We were part of the the transition team of V Ray at that point. <laughs> yeah, we got to do a lot of really deep debugging on V Ray. Yeah, and and I think that it. it uh, it gave me a much more solid set of fundamentals and rendering, right. which, uh, which, which was thanks to the team that we were working with more than my own efforts, really. So. Yeah, it was interesting because we basically, yeah, we, there was a lot of things we were trying to do in V-Ray and they were, we were having, you know, trying to get it fixed. Um, Vlado was very good at trying to make sure that he could support it as much as possible. In fact, he actually, I remember very specifically, there was one very weird bug that was extremely hard to reproduce that we had that had these little black speckles on reflections. And it was like, we couldn't figure out when it happened, what happened. And then the only way we could actually get it fixed is when Vlado sat down at the office, and like set started coding like on, on, on the shot itself. And, uh, yeah. and I think you were helping him like figure out like, okay, this is all I figured out. And then he finally like, you know, got it. He just picked it up like it was really not that heavy and walked all the way out of the room carrying it. <laughs> yeah. It was, you know, it's one of those moments that you're kind of um, excited by and a little bit embarrassed by as well. Like, man, I, I, here I was grunting at how heavy this task was. And, I know. actually remember him being like, got it like he was like kind of excited a little bit but vlado doesn't really show that much emotion so that's <laughs> but he did yeah. did it have a little bit of pride about uh, about doing that that was fun but okay so you said you said that was sort of your, your your you know your when you started to really get into to rendering or doing some some interesting like deep dives into that into that field which was interesting too but let's take a little back let's go a little further back than that like what what got you interested in computer graphics? What got you interested in the, in the vi visual effects industry? What, wh how did that all start? Um, well, I worked, you know, Vancouver had a big um, film community. Yeah. And when I was in my, like, 1920, one of my roommates was in the camera department. Okay. Doing a big IATSE training thing. And... Uh, Probably at that time, there was a lot of artists and sort of skateboard types that funneled their way to the film industry and took these kind of insanely hour, high paying gig jobs. And um, I was aiming to work as a set electric, kind of with the intention of um, going out on the set and seeing what I could do as far as practical effects went, because that was, you know, that seemed like fun. Right. Uh, and so I, I actually got a job at a, at a production services company, which is, you know, one of the ones that lends out all of the equipment to film sets. And I spent some time doing um, lighting on independent film projects. So on during the daytime, I was like coiling cable. <laughs> and during the weekends, I was plugging away, you know, lifting things or 
tying together cables for film sets. Wow. Um, and one of my friends came to me and said that the animation program that he was involved in had a visual effects component or a visual effects program that they would be offering in one of the next semesters. And, um, and I took a look into it and joined them in 1999. Okay. So I, I took a course that was soft image Maya and introduced kind of the hypershade graph editor and a lot of the soft body dynamics and sort of basic particle dynamics of Maya that were just being, um, just starting to really grow shape in film projects. But so um, you were self-taught then mostly on this stuff then? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I, I think that there's been a lot of lessons that have come from getting the opportunity to sit in the room with smart people, Sure. you know? Um, but when I, you know, school, I, I took some courses that were part of a bigger program, but I thought that I would gain more traction kind of completing it on my own. Um, and on high end 3d, which was the go-to resource at the time, yeah, I remember. <laughs> there was, um, there was positions that were very clear in their expectations of what people should have skills wise, right. you know? So, you know, they were asking shader writers, which is kind of what I wanted to do mm -hmm. and to have a skill set that included, um, C shell bash, uh, from Linux and then the render man shading language and some understanding of Perl and C. Right. And those were not part of the course that I took right, at right. all. Yeah. So I, I, I pivoted a little bit and I took to learning that stuff on my own at home. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's a lot. I mean, I remember, yeah. And some of those are, you know, not used as much today. Like people don't use Perl as much and then people have to start using <laughs> Python and other things. I remember that yeah. big switch was like, we're going to try a new scripting language called Python. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? Like I, I remember when the first, you know, there was a way to wrap C in, in, in a dish, in sort of a meta meta programming language that would compile out Python objects called swig okay. and somebody had figured out how to swig the Maya API so that you could make calls into Maya. And it coincided with an IT boss that I had who told me that I wasn't allowed to use Perl. You know? Okay. He wanted, he was, he was quite strong willed and he didn't want to deal with Perl because Perl required a secondary installation, whereas on Linux machines, Python was already native because it was part of the setup program in order to run the installer. Right. So it, it was kind of, um, it was his call and I was green enough that I just took his word as law. Right, right, know? right. Yeah, interesting. So you really got into to, to, to doing that. And I remember, you know, when we were, uh, uh, working on, uh, on Tron, you really got into the shading stuff and the t technical issues and, and debugging and all those different things, uh, in that area. So what, what, what were some of the projects that you worked on to, to, that were sort of doing that? Because I guess you were much more of a, a TD, right? You were on, on show TD that were, that, that's really what I knew you as in that, at that time. Yeah. I mean, um, I think that um, it's been really helpful to me through throughout my career to be able to um, build my own um, prototypes. You know, yeah. a lot of the time for the sake of a proof of concept, it's not enough to just explain to somebody that you, that something can be done. And, you know, sometimes getting something like massive to communicate with mental Ray and to produce render frames would require you to do a whole setup and configuration of a machine, some changes to the networking and to script out all of these repeated um, efforts that you need to sort of iterate. So I, I also kind of made a habit of sort of trading um, what I did know already to people in exchange for opportunities to work on things that were maybe more interesting, you know? Okay. So, 
while I was petitioning people to write shaders, I earned the responsibility of managing their render farms, which meant, you know, walking through um, output logs from the renderer and then stepping through functions and figuring out why, you know, similar to the problem you just described with Vlado, why you're getting these anomaly behaviors when certain things are combined with others. Right. That's actually a really yeah. good way, like managing a render farm is actually a really good way to learn lighting because you get to see everything and find out what's working and what's not working. Why is it rendering? Why is a rendering taking too long or why it's not, you know? So, yeah. 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 And, and I think that, you know, when, when people were able to work with RenderMan, it had a lot of features that were part of the renderer that made these like larger pipelines much easier. You know, you could fire a text stream at the open renderer and modify the text stream as it was being sent. So you could do things like replace a, a cube with an entire city. Right. Whereas on the ray tracing side, at least with mental ray years ago, you needed kind of an upfront footprint of everything that was going to be rendered in the scene. So it could start building a tree of all of the rays that would be cast for different purposes. Right. So there's like, you know, you're, you're bringing a tool into an environment where people already have a fully functioning set of um, workflows and tools. And in order to replace even a small part of that, you need to be able to give them back something that works as well as what they're already using, or else you, you find yourself in a lot of meetings with unhappy people. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a challenge. Uh, definitely, I know that it was a challenge when we when we were doing that. Uh, but uh, overall, I think the, the results, I was still really happy with the results of Tron. I think it looks fantastic. I think all the hard work that we did during that transition time, because there was a transition time where we, we transitioned a big portion of the show from mental ray to V-ray and did it in the middle of the show, which was uh, also yeah. <laughs> a no, yeah. no, uh, but, but we did it anyway. And I think in the end we were very, I mean, the results are great. They were really great. And I think that the people that worked on it and, and they did the hard work and figured out, you know, how we had to do all the translation. There was a lot of translation that had to be done. Huge chunks of pipeline, huge shaders had to be redone. Uh, but, um, but generally, uh, I think it looked fantastic and you guys did a fantastic job on it. So yeah. 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 I agree. And, you know, I, I was thinking about it in the last few days before we spoke and it was really, you know, the, the thing that stands out to me most is there was a moment in time where we ran a test and we had the, the sort of, um, futuristic bike. I can't remember. What oh, the light called. bikes. Yeah. Light bike, yeah. Um, riding along that black glass, yeah. And the motion blur, like somebody called out, you know, if the if if your camera is traveling at the same speed of the bike alongside of the bike, then the reflection of the bike in the glass shouldn't be blurred, right? And we could not, in any way, achieve a result that was um, a tunable and beautiful with mental ray. Um, and V-Ray was doing that out of box right. with like with a speed that we couldn't really match with, you know, this army of people working on rebuilding the shape. Yeah, I mean, that was the big crux, right? It was that the motion blur, m turning on motion blur in Mental Ray was just killed your render times, uh, like physical motion okay. blur, right? And so V-Ray basically had, had an advantage at that point. And that really was it, was the reflections on the glass. <laughs> like, yeah. That was, Which in the, in the whole that's the whole movie. That is the know? whole movie. Yeah, yeah. That's so, yeah. And and oddly, I, I ended up with some contacts at Mental Image and and understood already that, you know, ninety like Autodesk, mm -hmm. ninety five plus percent of their income comes from industrial, and not from media entertainment. Right. So the. The mental mental images had already made a decision years before that they weren't going to pursue modifying mental ray to make it work with motion blur. Right. You know, Autodesk was selling it to people and saying, you know, it, it can serve this purpose if you work with it properly. But at a at a root, it really wasn't intended to be used that way at all. And and it was sort of like banging your head against a wall trying to squeeze that performance out of it 
you know. It's interesting you say that. And it's it's so interesting if you think about it, like motion blur in itself is actually like a almost only used by visual effects people. <laughs> Yeah, and and it's interesting because I I just don't I always have it on if I'm going to do anything because I think things look more natural if there's motion anywhere right, and so mm -hmm. it's just interesting that it's like yeah, why would I have that? And it's like oh you know, uh, and and two D motion blur doesn't always work. Well, specifically the Tron example is exact one where two D motion blur just completely doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I I think that um, you know they. They continued with mental ray um, on what was the race car on Speed Racer on Speed Racer, yeah, yeah. And it became a compositing nightmare. Yeah, where they ended up having to completely break apart all of the different layers of the render and then apply two D motion blur to them and come up with all of these conditions where you know if the glass is transparent and reflective and you can see the object behind it. What do you do? And and it, you know I think that that type of effort I I think they you know it was smart that they decided to do something that was more brute force yeah. and more guaranteed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that sounds that sounds like a nightmare <laughs> for sure. Uh, well, that's interesting. So what did what what was where were you working before DD? Um, well, I was at Cafe FX. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, of all the things that I regret in not having a more formal education, um, at the at the point that I decided to go to the U.S. to work, mm -hmm. it, um, not having a degree made it really difficult for me to get a visa. Right. So I had been contacted by DD, who I was just in love with the idea of working for, um, a couple of times, and we would always get to the point that they were ready to sign a contract with me, but not willing to commit the time to hiring somebody who was like mid-level and had the visa requirement that I did. Right. So flash forward about um, a year later, and I had done a little bit of contract work with a few studios in LA mm -hmm. and my name got passed around and, and uh, it was cafe effects that eventually said, you know what, we, we have like three, Pro rendering problem projects right now that we would we need to have you sitting in here with us for right so, was it over uh, in their santa monica office or in uh or, or i worked office? in the santa monica office okay all right so yeah, was, was ben grossman there at the time and those kind of guys well, ben worked for the syndicate right um, oh right which was another was part of it creative, you know so we kind of passed in the hallway and kind of exchanged little quips about what was happening more right uh, at, at a company level but we, we didn't work together no okay because i know I'm, I'm just just trying to figure out your connection with ben because i know later you were you end up working for magnopus for a little bit as well which we'll get into to that but yeah uh, but it's interesting yeah yeah so that's that's cool what so were you working on pan or which were some of the projects you worked on at cafe fx when I first got there, they were on Pan's Labyrinth, right? Uh, and I think that they did the Mist from um, Stephen King after that. Okay. And and in fact, I think that it was the Mist that I joined at the tail end of. Right. Um, and uh, they did some outsource work for GI Joe, and then joined the Sony. Um, Alice project. Oh, Alice in Wonderland. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Which, um, which I think sunk the company. Really, it. it, uh, it, it that took. was the last one. I think that was the end of the company. Unfortunately, after that. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, that was a that was a challenge. I think Eric Sheely was probably. I think Eric Sheely was working on on Alice over there. It was a lighter. I don't know if you remember him or not. But, uh, but yeah, that was, that's interesting. That was interesting. So, so I know, okay. So you, you, you were at DD, you were on Tron. I don't remember if you, you, did you stick around for like Jack the Giant Killer or stuff like that? No, I, I, I you know, the roster of films that were in the, I, I, you know, I really wanted to work with Dave Fincher. Oh, right. I, I had a, I had a real, I had a real love for his work since I started, um, in school, you know, seven and the game had come out shortly before I started school. Right. And they were like, you know, they were the pinnacle of what I wanted to work on. So 
you know, I, I think that the Benjamin Button project was just finishing when I got there. Yeah. And, you know, I got to sit in on dailies a couple of times, which was fun. Um, and then he took his next project, the social network to a film production studio in Mexico city. Yeah. And the, the, the only other thing that DD had going was that battle robots, but something steel. Oh, real steel. Yeah. Real steel. Yeah. And it was, you know, I, I, um, I wasn't much interested in continuing as part of, uh, as part of the lighting team there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I Fincher. Okay. I want to ask you something, just like a little detour. I mean, you, you've, you've had some good, what is, what are your thoughts on Fincher in terms of what he's doing today? Because I think as a director, he's taking an initiative to be very proactive about pr prioritizing the way he's doing things for streaming and really sort of taking streaming as a, as a, as a, as a very serious platform for filmmaking. Um, and I, I saw Mank recently and I was like, this is a, it's a really good film uh, and technically really interesting. All the things he achieves. I mean, what are your, some, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't guess if he was targeting streaming. I think that, um, I saw some things in the Mank, like, you know, rather than fading to black, they actually kept fading to different levels of, um, of, uh, I want to say gamma, but exposure where like the brightest light sources in the scene would kind of hang yeah. before it completely became black. And it, it seemed very like HDR friendly. And it, it, it had a lot of, um, my understanding anyways, is that he used a lot of led panels as projection surfaces to do the, the VFX, you know, his record, he, he actually interned at ILM at one point. He's got a yes. record reputation for being like a really um really technical director with a deep understanding of the 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 um the uh, science of what it is that's happening be on, on our teams yeah you know? and he's very very good i mean i worked with him on girl with a dragon tattoo um and he 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 knows his stuff you know he knows color really well he knows cameras really well uh, I think they actually used a, 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 a very a special edition of the red camera that only shoots black and white. So they don't have any color sensors on it. It's a black and white sensor uh, for, for Mac, which I thought was very, very interesting. I just think it's interesting that, you know, some of the technology and some of the way people are thinking about filmmaking is changing a little bit now. Obviously, uh, streaming has become a bigger priority in terms of releasing films and uh, I think Fincher has got some really good ideas out there. Obviously he, sh he just signed a three-year contract with Netflix. So I think, or, or a big deal, a big, a big contract with Netflix. And it's a kind of interesting what he's doing. Uh, yeah. So it's interesting. You were talking about Fincher, uh, as well. Uh, well, cool. Okay. So after you, 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 you left DD and then where did you end up going after that? I spent a little bit of time at the mill, oh, you right. know, one of the, the head of, technology there or the CTO, I can't remember what his title was, mm -hmm. actually contacted me in December um, of, of the time that I was at DD. So and this I is the mill in LA? The mill LA. Yeah. And they, they said like, you know, we, we haven't really been in a position to hire um, TDs and developers outside of London up until recently. And we're scaling up our operation in Santa Monica do you want to come and join us and help with some of the problems that are related to, you know, having, having offices in multiple shores. Right. So they had New York and Los Angeles and London at the time. And, uh, and most of their pipeline was done through some really kind of, um, uh, hard and basic scripts, you know, like R sync copies from one location to another. Right. So, we we um we started working on building kind of something similar to atomic which was like a sort of render outputs to gather elements from the scene graph and then package them up as dependencies so that they could get sent for processing or rendering or right. simulating or whatever it was yeah we should probably uh, explain what atomic is because that's a very dd thing <laughs> atomic was a, a was basically a like a, a render layer manager of some kind that that was pretty actually 
I really liked Atomic. It became something pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that, um, I think like a lot of things, it was born out of ESC. Oh, and, right. You know, like a lot of the concepts that went into it came out of that team of like Rito and J- John John Litt. Litt yeah. They work so closely together. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the more impressive things that I've seen, like from a code code side, you know, I, there's a lot of, there's a lot of really hacky ways to get data in and out of Maya. And this was just like readable and extensible right. and beautifully written. So, and I think know. that, it, um, it was, uh, Blake, uh, Sweeney who, who kind of created a sort of like a, your own very simple scripting language that you could just write down what you wanted. <laughs> Like I want a layer that does this. And then what was amazing in, in, in Maya, basically with you, it would did this, it would build all the layers for you. Like you just hit a script and it built it. It's like, I want this. And then like, it would build all those scripts for you. It was, it was quite robust and really quite nice. So, and you know, obviously it's grown even better and, and more since then, but um, it was, it was, it was quite, quite good. So, so anyway, sorry to go back to the, to, the, to, uh, to your time at the mill. So that was something that you were working on at that time too, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, they were interested in, uh, they, they gave us a pretty broad uh, brush for R&D projects, and we ended up getting a hold of the first um, Maya to Arnold pipe, pipeline. Okay. You know, they had the, the first Maya to, to Arnold um, exporter was open source. Yes, the and, M2A uh, one, right? That was, yeah. M2A, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so I worked with their team to migrate their existing shading pipeline over to Arnold and in the process um, got offered a job at Sony doing similar. So I, I stayed with the mill for a few months mm-hmm. and, and um, got brought into the Sony Pictures um, shader writing team to do, a, to do a C shader to OSL conversion that they wanted to run. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it, there, there was a lot. It, it's such an odd time. Um, you know, when I work, I really enjoyed working with Stephen Parker. And at one point we were out for lunch and I was talking about, you know, pipelines and as, as often you do. Mm-hmm. And he just kind of in a really stoic, like sure way said, Sony did it right. Like the way that Sony handles their product resolution and their asset management is the way that everybody else should have done it. And so I kind of started looking immediately for opportunities within uh, Sony Pictures and Imageworks mm-hmm. because uh, I wanted to see it firsthand and to see, you know, to sort of consume it as a piece of information because um, at that point I'd probably touched most people's pipelines in a small way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did, I worked for a moving picture company in 2005 okay. uh, in London, and, uh, we wrote one of the first sort of dependency packaging APIs that would, you know, pull assets out of Maya and figure out which, you know, which compositing layer had which objects belonging to it. And, uh, the sort of time from 2005 up to 2012, working for spy i i saw a lot of different ways that people were trying to solve the same problem you know temerity and shotgun and a lot of these asset management tools were variations of the same job right you know? yeah yeah well cool so 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 but you where what were you working on uh with uh what were you working on when you were at uh at imageworks uh, uh, switching the C physical shading library over to OSL. Yeah, I know that, but was there any particular show that you were working on or, or, or was uh, it, oh, you were just made all overall pipeline, I guess. That, yeah, yeah. 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 I think I, I sat in on Spider-Man and helped debug some, you know, broken shading graphs that were causing problems. Um, some of the work that I was responsible for was building support for OSL into Katana so that, you know, some of the, the ways that the workflows that artists had to like branch a shader and create subgraphs, that that was functioning in OSL the way that it already had with their previous shaders. Right. Um, and, and so a lot of that meant going and sitting with people and helping them debug. But the, the shading group itself was pretty siloed. 
and um, and uh, image works work work that way. Right, right. That's interesting. Yeah, because yeah, I my time at. ImageWorks was I was the last show to ever use burps. <laughs> oh, cool! Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, I I was not a fan of burps, um, and uh, it was my last Render Man show too. And I basically said uh, I will never render a shadow map ever again in my life. Is basically what I I, I promised myself at that point. Uh, but I know that you know that was the first big transition. That was that was uh, during that time. It was when. Uh, they just uh, and I was actually working with uh, you know Marcos was working in the you know at the same time at at Sony, and they were first bringing in uh, Arnold to work on on Monster House, and so it was it was you know what and that was <laughs> just like you were talking about earlier about you know the first transition at DD uh, to on a big show to use uh, V-Ray they were struggling with the with that in terms of Monster House as well. So, uh, but it was, it was really interesting. And I think obviously all those things have changed. And Marcos has actually been on uh, this podcast before. So uh, that was also, oh, cool. yeah, 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 it was, it was really interesting. Okay. So, so how long were you at Sony for? I worked with Sony for almost a year and a half. Okay. I, they, part of my contract included moving back to Vancouver. And I think, I'd been in LA for about six years at that point, maybe seven. Right. And um, I wasn't a, you know, I wasn't completely um, opposed to the idea at the time. So it was, you know, I think um, it felt like it was time to go home. And I worked, I worked with Sony for a little bit in their Vancouver office, but um, to be honest, it was a pretty unhappy time in VFX. Mm. Like, a lot of people had been asked to move and not really explained to the greater benefit of why that would happen. Yep. And it, within the team that I was working for, and then very nearby, there was a lot of like frequent conversation about people feeling hard done by and upset and, you know, challenging things that were arbitrary, but because they were angry about other things that were going on. So, you know, I worked, I worked in in the Vancouver office for all of about six months. Okay, and then a good friend of mine, um, who I had worked with previously in Vancouver, um, offered to have me come in and work on his cinematics team, and uh, and I, I was happy to have an opportunity to pivot a little bit away from visual effects, and um, and that actually turned out to be really um, advantageous. To yeah. Okay. Well, that's cool. Well, what was it? What were, what was the cinematic thing you were doing? Well, so the studio is called Gold Tooth, and um, you know, again, it was another guy who had come out of ESC Entertainment uh -huh. and was connected sort of loosely to me for all of these other people I had met along the way, and um, we did some of the we did the Arkham Origins trailers, mm -hmm. some of that, like uh, you know some of the the stuff that. Um, we did some stuff for Crisis CryEngine. Um, they, they, I think that was called the Shark Dress Man trailer, and um, some of it was high enough quality that it actually went to television as commercials. And um, the the companies were generally impressed. You know, we I we we uh, we turned their shading pipeline around and made it physical, and then streamlined a lot of what what they were doing at the time was taking whole scenes out of the game engine and then rendering, you know, like converting them to high quality assets and then building new scenes out of them from scratch mm -hmm. and then placing their cameras and deciding where to render. Right. And we kind of just said like, you know, why don't we adopt a stronger storyboard and diagramming process right. and we'll, we'll rebuild what's directly in front of the camera and as much stuff as we don't need to animate, we will paint it using ZBrush and leave it facing the camera in a high quality with no back. So we took this kind of hmm. 2.5 D approach to, um, to rendering that cut down the amount of team that we needed a lot. Interesting. Um, and then sort of tried to build a pipeline that would allow us to do as much in-game rendering as possible. Because the more that the game studios were able to advertise that their cinematics were in camera, the more that they could advertise that 
this is what the experience in the game would be like. Right. You know? So um, fortunately, you know, CryEngine had a 32-bit frame buffer and it was floating point. Mm -hmm. So we could actually marshal data into it and back out directly into Nuke. And we had a kind of, uh, we had a compositing pipeline that was using their engine as a renderer pretty quick. Interesting. Um, in the case of Unity, and I think it was, um, the Warner Brothers had a custom cut of Unreal. Um, both of those were a little bit more difficult to get 30 frame a second animated frames out of, you know, and they had eight bit buffers. So there was lots of consideration about how to take our high quality 3D scenes and then convert them so that they would run in engine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so was that your first foray into real time rendering? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that was probably 2015. 2015. Okay. Because it wasn't that long after that that I think I ran into you at SIGGRAPH. And I was with Stephen Parker, actually, at the time. And you were showing me, like, I've got this thing. <laughs> and you were showing me yeah. you were showing me the, the, the Leia thing. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> What's going on here? I was well, so, mind blown. I, mean, I, uh, I, I was able, when I returned to Canada, to work as a freelancer, which wasn't something that was possible for me while I was in the U.S. Of course, right. And um, while I was at Goldtooth, HP Diker reached out to me from um, within Autodesk and said, hey, we've got these challenges, one of which includes converting the hypergraph to OSL. Are you interested in doing some freelance work with us? Right. And so I, I was trying to scale up freelance work and looking all over the place for sort of 3D-based rendering contracts mm -hmm. and came upon... Um, came upon this studio in, uh, or not the studio is wrong, a startup in the Silicon Valley that had a 3D, like a 3D display, which is essentially like a multi-view stereo display. Right. And, um, we had a couple of conversations and it turned out that, you know, they, they owned the patents on the, the backend technology and they were vetted strongly by a lot of investors and, came out of the HP um, labs in Palo Alto. So it was, you know, it was a piece of technology that um, had been born at HP, but HP had for one reason or another decided not to invest in. And so the owner of Leia, a guy named David Fatal, had, who was responsible for writing patents at HP at the time, um, wrote a patent on the work, presented it to HP and said, if you're not interested in this, I'd like to know um, what would be involved in me extracting this and starting my own company around it. Right. You know? So uh, I joined them in July of 2015. No, 2015. No, I guess, I guess like the first time I touched real time would have been 2014. Okay. I hadn't been using Unity for that long, okay. to be honest. Um, and they wanted a tool that was first going to be a 3D graph editor in Node.js that was kind of like Pastebin, where you know you would log into this sort of Pastebin account, and it would allow you to connect your display over USB and then build scenes inside of a web browser and then hit play, and they would stream out to the device and the device would sort of act as like an external and playback for you, you know? Right. Um, and I sat down to working on that with them for um, a couple of days and they got all hot and bothered about the Unity plugin needing to be handled sooner because they had customers in automotive that wanted it right away. Right. Interesting. So, yeah. So we rolled a plug-in and um, I actually reached out to Ben, who I bumped into at Seagraph, mm -hmm. and 
um, I shipped that plugin to them and I had Magnolcus creating content for the device about three months after I got there. Yeah. I remember that. Uh, well, it's interesting you say that. So I remember how that, that happened. You were showing me display and just so people understand what we're talking about, we're, you had it on, 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 a, on the size of a, of a phone. It was like about a, a phone display that was about the size of it. And it was a, it was like a, it was a, basically a 3d display that didn't require glasses and in, in, in really, yeah. uh, and it was, it was, it was really good. Uh, you know, and I, I think that the, the term Leia comes from, you know, Princess Leia as <laughs> the little hologram that appears in Star Wars. That was sort of the inspiration yeah. behind it. But I remember you showing that to me. I was like, that's really interesting. And then I was hanging out at Magnopus because I like to hang out there every now and then because it's a cool office. Uh, mm -hmm. And I sat next to Sally and she says, I'm looking at this cool new thing. And I'm like, wait a minute, I've seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> and so Sally was working with you guys uh, on doing that. So it was pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah, I, I was really lucky to have her as a partner on that side. Yeah. You know, she, um, she solved on her own some problems with creating content that we hadn't really come up with solutions for internally yet, you know? Right. And, um, the display was touch compatible and it was actually she and I together that, sort of figured out how to um, read touch inputs across the multi-view because, you know, the location of your finger is not necessarily the location in frame. Oh, right. And they had some weird, you know, they had some weird tricks in order to get the frame on screen that included doing some rotations of the image so that when you first would touch it, it was like, it, it was like Nightcrawler, you know, your finger would just, teleport all over the screen <laughs> and it was like every project that we worked on had like a two week deadline you know yep. where it was just like well it's lexus and they want to see something a week from now and you're like you know well what exactly do they want to see oh they want to see what this would look like if you had a fully 3d avatar in it sitting inside of a car and it's like Whoa. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah. you know they know. You know, working within VFX, there's at least some cognizance of the ask that you're being given. And these guys were like exceptionally smart and really hardworking, and did not understand the massive teams that it took in order to generate high quality film projects. Right. You know, so. Um, there was a lot of asset store purchases and a lot of hacking of scripts and, you know, um, trying to get things running at the same time as trying to make them look beautiful, which was turned out to be really fun, you know? Yeah. 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 For sure. For sure. I thought it was a really interesting project and it was really cool, uh, that you were doing that. Uh, and it was, yeah, pretty interesting Did you, you ended up going to work at Magnopus for a little bit, didn't you? I did. Um, you know, when Leia hit their um, Series B funding, yeah. um, we had a couple of discussions about, you know, what what avenues were opening up within the company. And I, I was probably a little bored at the time of, you know, pushing on content that, that I didn't really get to see the whole way through. Um, and, and I talked to the guys at Magnopus and we sort of, describe some of the problems that they were having with projects that were in the works. And, um, and a, a couple of months later I joined them. Oh, wow. Yeah. And you, you moved back to LA at that point, right? Yeah. 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 I, I took, you know, I did the 40 year old thing and I went to India for a little while and then I took like three months and drove around in a car and slept on my friend's couches and like surfed and ate bad food. And it was, you know, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool that's cool but i know you probably can't talk too much i mean there's very rarely do you have to get to talk about actual projects that come out of magnopus but is there anything you can tell us of what you were working on over there um well the first you know i worked on the three magic league projects that came out in october of 2018 okay 2018 um and those were um uh, ben led them 
and they were working with John Gaeta to make some um, content. He was like a creative yep. executive at Magic Leap, and they had some kind of keynote presentations of work that they wanted to do. And um, I, I worked with them kind of with the intention of defining where they had problems in their pipeline because they had a much larger project that they were planning and they wanted to sort of use, um, they wouldn't clearly, they wanted to figure out what would be the challenges in doing such a huge project, you know? Right. The second project was like a walk, you know, like a, a theme park size walk through AR experience. And it was going to be very story driven and required like a, MMO back end in order to like feed people location information and to update the content in front of them. Okay. So, you know, the problems that they had were the same problems that you would have in a boutique that was doing like commercials and decided that they wanted to do a feature animation like the next week. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that. Yeah, that sounds like a like a like a massive project for sure, for sure. Yeah. But you really, I guess, you really got into AR at that point. I mean, with the, with Leia and with with your Match Leap stuff, AR became something that was sort of an important part of it. Yeah, um, I mean, I certainly like the challenge of finding new stuff to work on, and you know, um, the the uh, there's a lot of work that has yet to be spoken for in figuring out all of the different ways that we made content look beautiful in film and how to realize those same things technically on a mobile handheld device, you know? Right. I mean, ultimately, Leia's product is an Android product and uh, the Magic Leap is an Android product and the Oculus Quest is an Android operating system with some custom gear built on top of it. Right. But ultimately, you know, the challenge is um, how many milliseconds do I have to run any one part of this code or to use that code to create pixels? And it, it's kind of fun working against the clock like that. No. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't, you don't have that much compute power and you have to, and you have to have very low latency <laughs> and a lot of frame rates. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of like counterintuitive in a lot of ways. Well, it probably feels like the way that our work did in like 2005 and six, right. you know, where it's like, as you start heading towards the end of a project, you start to lose sight of what the cost of your technology is versus the cost of choices that you've made to do texturing, lighting, shading. And you start to have to throw things off of the boat in order to make it the whole way, right? you know, and without like a real clear view of budgeting for each of those different disciplines or, you know, you, you really are always going to find yourself in a position where, you know, the, the, the goal in mobile rendering is to use as much of the resources you can and not more. Right. Right. Yeah. So the answer is make it look better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's more bandwidth, then you need to consume that bandwidth. And, you know, so you're kind of always jockeying that line where um, you're, you're trying to beat the clock, which is, you know, uh, it keeps the game a little bit fresh. Yeah. Yeah. But it is, I think it's interesting you say, you know, especially when it comes to real time, right? So now, you know, you, you've kind of nailed it when you say, you know, when we were doing back in 2000, you know, three, four, five, you know, when people weren't using ray tracing, right. And so it was much more of a, of a, of a, of a rasterized, uh, a thing back then and trying to get, it was always a battle of, you know, can I keep, can I raise the quality and still get my render time to be under two hours, right. Or whatever it is, or do I yeah. have enough RAM? or even back then, you know, especially a lot of the machines, uh, you know, if you're on a windows machine, you only had 32 <laughs> bit operating systems and only can yeah. hold two gigs of memory on a computer, which sounds insane these days. So, uh, you know, those are, those are challenges we met. And uh, it's interesting now that we're, we're back now and we're doing that and we're looking at this as, as a, as a, you know, th we want to do something at, at 60 or 90 Hertz or 120 Hertz <laughs> and that, and we, we have to bring, we have to, we're, we're back to those days when it was like, okay, we can cut this out. We don't need that in memory, like whatever it is. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. but, but I mean, is, are you still very much interested in real time at this point? 
Yeah, in fact, um, maybe September, I did some um, I did some prototype work for a company here in Vancouver that had like a a WebGL product, mm-hmm. and I I bumped into you know they asked for something that was like highly reflective and physically based, but at the same time would be um, built dynamically using web based assets. You know, they had this huge database of like um, sports paraphernalia data that they wanted to be able to assemble into these shareable um, tokens for a mobile phone app. Okay. You know, users would sort of lay their bets or do their gameplay, and then they would get a copy. They would get these sort of um, objects that were half sports highlight video and half sort of custom LA Lakers swag or something like that. Okay. You know? um, and it, the the visual target was pretty high quality. Hmm. And when I stepped out into looking at um, what what the state of the art was, um, I found an engine called Babylon hmm. and uh, Babylon.js, and the they have full photorealistic rendering in browser using nothing but HTML5, and it accesses the GPU with the same slickness as uh, using an embedded app like uh, Unity would on a mobile phone. Interesting. So uh, the last couple of months, I've been kind of working a lot of my 3D video content into interactive 3D scenes that are based on that Babylon engine. Kind of with the intention of um, helping companies scale up around using 3D data in a browser. You know, the, the latest version of Firefox um, has a send tab to XR device button built into it. Okay. So there's sort of this vision of the future that maybe I'm not alone in um, where people would be sitting like I am now and pop on something like an Oculus Quest and use a single button to send a VR or AR experience to that device. Okay. I think uh, in, a, in the augmented reality um, world, I think it's Qualcomm has a chip that's coming out. Anyway, there's an initiative on 5K to build proprietary augmented reality glasses that will stream content directly from your phone. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So sort of similarly, you'd be walking down the street and get an email message from somebody that says, I want you to take a look at the latest uh, version of something or other that I've built for you. And you could pull the glasses out of your pocket, pop them on, and then view them in, in a 3D context. You right. know, using kind of like Quest, using um, hand gestures instead of input tools. Yeah. You know, one of the, I, I see some very interesting AR use cases all the time. And, and like one of the ones that, that makes the most sense, and this is in the architecture uh, point of view is um, specifically using, because when they build a, a hospital, right? Like hospitals are a great example. A hospital has tons and tons and tons of, of uh, mechanical stuff, right? You got oxygen lines going through there. You got air ducts, you got air filtration, you've got a lot of, you know, water and different things fl- flowing through the, through the building. Uh, and all that stuff needs maintenance. Uh, and it's kind of a complicated thing to figure out all the maintenance and where to go, et cetera, et cetera. But what they did is because the whole building is built in 3D now, when they build it using Revit, they actually create a, a augmented reality applications where you just put you know, your, your augmented reality HoloLens or whatever you're doing, and you put it on and you walk around the building and it says, oh, stop here, that right there, that needs maintenance. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, well, that's awesome <laughs> as opposed to you like i don't know where do i go you know it's like no 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 it'll, it'll tell you where to go <laughs> well and i think you know going back to what we were speaking about earlier i i think um the industrial use case is orders of magnitude more important than media entertainment yes and and i think that hololens or microsoft really hit the nail on the head with the audience that they're targeting with hololens too you know right there's I was reading just today that there's something like an 82% improvement in performance on people who are looking at a heads up view of an instruction manual versus people who are flipping through pages in a book. Right. You know, 
And um, that, you know, that was something that probably in the days of Leia, we started to, to discuss, you know, automotive is a better choice for us than video games. And, you know, what, what are some other cases like education is a huge one. You know, mm -hmm. If you could, if you could get somebody to interact with an experience by touching the screen three times, there's a 700% increase in retention of information. Interesting. So, putting somebody down in front of an experience, which is sort of the angle that I was thinking when I decided to make a portfolio site. It's like, if you can get someone to reach out and touch it and see it and touch it two more times, then they will walk away speaking to themselves mentally about what it is that they've just done. Mm. And that's, that's impactful in a way that, you know, like a flip book or a contact sheet really can't be. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Really interesting. Really interesting. Okay, so let's catch up a little bit to where we are today. So, so, so you're 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 back in Vancouver at this point, and you said you're looking to go back to Europe, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, I uh, I'm I'm lucky in that the work that I'm being offered at this point is mostly remote, mm -hmm. um, and I uh, I think that for for the way that I'm enjoying spending my time these days, um, I think that I'm going to continue to work remotely. And so I've been looking at contracts in and around the EU that would be related to things like uh, autonomous vehicles or computer vision. And maybe, you know, um, there's a lot of work kind of in, in, in sort of general 3D pipelines and 3D rendering that's related to creating synthetic data for um, computer vision testing. And so I've been talking to a number of people out that way about projects that they have and sort of. Um, narrowing, um, narrowing the scope of people whose doors I want to knock on when I get there. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. There's, I've, I've seen a lot of use cases where people are using high-end CG work to create use cases to train computer vision AI. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, fundamental to um, uh, machine learning is domain adaptation, mm -hmm. and that just means adding a little bit of noise to your samples so that you can train your algorithm to see the same thing without having to go out and get an entirely new data set, you know, right. and using 3d, you can actually read the performance of your algorithm against the data that it's looking at and identify specific cases where your system is having trouble, you know, um, finding, or isolating pieces within the frame, you know, segmenting. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah you basically like have that. ultimate control of your 3D environment if it's all in CG, right? Right. I mean, you can put a tree in front of a stop sign a million different ways using like pretty off the shelf uh, tools in an application like Houdini, right. which speaks directly to Unreal. So, you know that's okay. Let's. That's a great. I mean, I I I I just realized what you just said when you said that is like, oh right, because if I'm doing a computer vision program and I'm teaching an autonomous car to see the road, there's going to be lots of cases where a tree is in front of a stop sign and it has to be able to recognize that stop sign behind the tree. We know it because yeah. we're human, but the computer does not. So we have to train it to understand that there's a stop sign behind there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you watch, there's a Google did a talk on their autonomous stuff recently. Okay. One of them was um, Tesla. The guy who runs the AI department in Tesla is one of the most interesting people whose name I can't repeat right now mm -hmm. that I've listened to in the, in the last long time. Mm -hmm. He speaks incredibly quickly and he's so information rich. It's, it's astounding. Right. But he did a presentation and he was talking about the variations in a stop sign. And there was 40 something different cases, you know, right. Sometimes a stop sign is attached to the back of a school bus and the school bus is parked or sometimes it's attached to the back of a school bus and the school bus is moving. Right. And sometimes it's attached to a draw arm in a parking lot. Yep. And sometimes it's attached to a draw arm and it's completely faded and somebody spray painted on top of it. <laughs> so there's like, you know, if you think about how, easy it would be to generate the subset of those variations using 3d software versus going out and searching for locations where those things had happened it's a it's, it's a pretty clear case 
Yeah, I remember actually seeing a, a a video that went out about this this garage that had a sign that looked like a stop sign that poked out of the garage, and these Teslas were just like <laughs> stopping in front of this garage every time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah uh, okay so actually uh, you know what are your thoughts about about computer vision and and that area because i know you know very famously tesla made this point that they said they don't feel that that lidar is necessary uh when it comes to autonomous driving where everyone else is using lidar to try to do things and they think that basically if you have a very robust uh, uh computer vision system through through ai that you know, the car can see just like any other person sees. It doesn't need a LIDAR to be able to do that. What are, do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, in my understanding, you know, in the same video that I was talking about a second ago, he describes them taking their, um, what, they, I mean, they're not using LIDAR because losing, using LIDAR would create a massive data set that they don't want to be responsible for maintaining. And it also would require them to, um, support more than one camera format. Right. You know? Whereas with like the nine or 15, whatever cameras that they have around the vehicle, they can actually stitch them all together into a single three dimensional view and then use stereo reprojection to figure out the distance that any one of those pixels is from the camera that took the picture. Right. So you're kind of getting the benefit of LIDAR from a data set that doesn't require you to maintain it, you know? Right. When the car itself is making decisions, they're stitching the 3D view and then converting it into a bird's eye view, and then they're making decisions about right and left turns in a completely two-dimensional plane. So, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like what you want in small hardware, and that is to collapse down the instructions as many times as you can so that you're getting the most for the least amount of compute. You know? Right, right. Yeah, that's and interesting. I, would say I agree, but mostly because of how much I admire what I've seen them accomplish. You know, if if I owned lidar, I might have a different um, opinion on it. Right. But yeah, I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting that definitely, you know, there's a there's a there's a whole you know very very interesting world of of computer vision. And, and training and all of that. And it's really interesting that you've gotten involved in that at this point. Do you, do you feel like at this point you're not as interested to going back to visual effects or to the entertainment industry? Does is, is this new path seem more, much more viable and, and, and interesting to you? Yeah. I mean, I think that when I first started looking outside of visual effects, it was because um, it's benefited my career to continue to have new things to learn, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I, I don't really sit well with the idea that um, what I'm being asked to do tomorrow, somebody else might be able to do just as well as me um, and be sitting next to me, you know? So as much as possible, going out and consuming new information means going out and understanding how to solve new problems. And, and I think that, um, you know, there's always a concern that you've swam too far away from the shore and you're neither the you know, you're not a TD anymore and you're not a shader writer and you're kind of stuck with half of a skill set in two different places. And, you know, half of a skill set doesn't really get you very well, very far in either of those two places. So um, I feel like I'm far enough out there at this point that um, I can continue to find work in, in these um, industries. And, and, uh, and I actually in recent months been working as an advisor for some small startup companies who um, who have a 3D backend that they need domain expertise on. So, right. um, for sure. Yeah, I well, think it's really interesting. I mean, I, obviously I did, you know, a similar thing. I've moved away from visual effects and I don't know how, how easy it would be for me to go back into production i don't and you know i left it for a re i left it for many reasons you know including the one that you mentioned before i wasn't necessarily willing to to move to vancouver even though i love uh the city it's just you know my, my wife had a job here and i just wasn't going to tell her to quit her job so that we because that's what i was told i have to do uh that was one of them the other one is also just you know shot production is grueling <laughs> you know yeah. 
and and sometimes it's just like uh, I you know I needed something different and I was inspired you know by by what uh, Chaos Group is doing and they they do touch a lot of different markets um, and it's really interesting. But I was I was really I thought it was really interesting when I met you uh, at SIGGRAPH and you showed me it's like I'm doing something completely different now and then it was like that is really interesting and I think the use cases are are, are really interesting as well. So really cool. Yeah. Well, you know, we saw um, at the at the point that I left them the content that we had worked on together, um, Ben and I and Sally. Um, it was the uh, it was what got them the contract with Red Camera and won them an award at the Display Week. Yeah, and you know, the they they took a significant boost, and it set them kind of it set the Series B funding in motion. So, you know, that, that was a huge benefit to the company. And it also created an opportunity for me to step out of the picture without disaffecting existing work. Right. So, you know, um, that was, it was, it was fun, you know, and, and the, the challenges within a startup are maybe um, as many as you would find in a VFX production, but there's, um, there's something to be said for having ownership of the thing that you're creating and, and having a, a, a need to spend the money that you're getting and not to save it, you know? Right. I mean, startups sell themselves to investors by how much resources that they can consume because, you know, if they consume all the money that they gave you and came up with something, then they need more. Right, you know? right, right. Yeah. And, Working, you know, working against a budget is quite a grueling and difficult thing, and, and uh, I totally agree with you. Yeah, uh, you know, even even in the case of Magnopus, um, I was quite lucky in them entertaining me as a research and development and sort of back end programmer, and it kept me away from some of the pace of um, doing shot work. Yeah. You know? yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Well, cool. Well, listen, Robert, it's been uh, really cool. Uh, you know, we're we're over an hour, but uh, which is which is fine, which is fine. Uh, but I really appreciate you you coming on. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, Kristen will tell you that you uh, after we we say our goodbyes, just hang on for a little bit because we'll need to upload the rest of the video file. Uh, okay. But it was. Uh, but yeah, it's been awesome talking to you, man. I'd really good. I, every time every time we chat, you always have some very interesting things and points of view about about how things are going. And I really like what you're, what you're saying about computer vision. And that's a, that's a very fun and creative and thought provoking problem to solve. You know, computer vision is really interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks. And it was cool to catch up as well. I, if you get a chance, um, you should look at the Babylon, um, Babylon JS. It's, okay. Uh, quite interesting. And, you know, probably the next generation of it, which will be web GPU and not web GL, it's going to have the compute shading that we relied on to do a lot of the really high end work at Magnopus. Interesting. So it will be um, pretty exciting what it will be possible to do in a browser quite shortly. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I think there's obviously, you know, there's a lot of new, like you said, there's also a lot of new hardware out there that's going to make things very interesting uh, as well. You know, obviously, you know, we've we've heard all about the M1 chip from Apple is very interesting. I mean, I've also, you know, on the other spectrum, I've got, I've got a 64 core, a single CPU socket on my computer these days, which is insane. So I think that, you know, hardware is going to be able to deal with a quite a bit of, uh, of, of stuff these days. So I think it's going to be really interesting what happens in the next few years and how people are going to take advantage of that. NVIDIA or NVIDIA starts actually handing out cards again. We'll all have RTX to play with at home. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I, we, we were, we're, we partner with NVIDIA, so they, they do give me some hardware sooner than people get these days. So nice. I, yeah, yeah. I'm a little bit more fortunate, but, the, but we do a lot of great work with them and they're very much a supporter of our GPU render. So they want to make sure that we have the hardware that we can test all this stuff on. So we make sure that happens so that by the time you do get your GPU, you know, that V-Ray GPU will work as well as it can on it. <laughs> Well, cool. All right. Thanks a lot, Robert. I appreciate it. Cheers, man. And have a good week.